Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So I have a microphone in one hand, and I have a stopwatch in the other hand. And we are going to try and experiment here. So somebody, I can't remember who, suggested it'd be fun to have a bunch of lightning talks specifically on assembly language. And so that's what we're going to try and do. So we have six speakers, and we're going to try to stick to five minutes each plus one question if they can stay in their five-minute box. And if not, then they don't get a question. Um, if we have time at the end, then maybe we can circle back. And if there's more questions that they can answer, uh, that'll be great. So we're going to start off with Mark Pilgrim. And so, Mark, take it away. Hello. Hello. So I want to talk to you about the bit opcode. Many of you may have seen this opcode um, in for toggling soft switches. It's common. It's a common way. This uh, these four will put you on HGR page one, and uh, you can also use them for other soft switches uh, to change to you know a, a bank switch in RAM, change to aux mem or uh, main mem. You can use bit to hit the speaker at CO30. Um, very popular because it does not change the value of any register. And as you know, you only have three registers. So that's kind that you tend to use all three of them. Not always, but so I always tend to use bit for uh, hitting soft switches. Obviously, for soft switches like uh, disk-related things, uh, COEC, to go get the, the value of the data latch, you actually want the value, presumably, so you need to use LDA. But for things where you just need to hit it so that something happens, like switching graphics modes or switching memory banks, you can use BIT. Uh, BIT for hiding. Uh, this is a, a fun, cute obfuscation technique, but also a, a way to save one byte, potentially, uh, depending on how your code is structured. Uh, this is taken from the uh, RWTS code in Archon. So this, was, this is real code. This is production code that was used by Electronic Arts. Uh, and it's uh, checking, uh, comparing to DE, so it's looking for the epilogue uh, after the one of the sector fields. And then if that uh, is equal, then it branches to 9BF. Well, if you look, 9BF, I mean, if you're looking at a listing, 9BF doesn't seem to exist. Like, that's in the middle of another instruction. But what it's doing is it's creating two code paths and in three bytes. So if the epilogue matched, then it hits the second byte of this instruction. What is this? What is the second byte? 18, which is a clear carry. And otherwise, it falls through, hits the sec, set carry, and then the bit 18 acts as a two-byte no-op. Huh. In the sense that it, it doesn't, it, it does change some flags, but it does not change the carry flag. So, for the purposes of what we were, you know, trying to decide, uh, uh, Carry clear, meaning that the disk uh, routine succeeded. Carry set, meaning it failed. And all the other flags being ignored. This is a way of doing that. Bit for hacking. Say you have uh, a J, you're, you're trying to remove the copy protection from a program. Not that anyone would ever do that. Uh, and you find, oh, I think that this is the call to the copy protection routine. JSR 8635. So I'm going to, on my copy, obviously, not the original disk, I'm going to change that JSR to a bit, because, which is useful. Obviously, you could just use three no-ops, EA, EA, EA. I did that a lot in my youth, my misspent youth. But using bit instead functions as a three-byte no-op. You use the absolute address version, uh, which takes a two-byte parameter. The previous one, this is actually the, the zero-page um, addressing mode of bit, which takes one-byte parameter. But there's another one that takes two bytes. So it, it functions as a three-byte no-op. And if you were wrong, one minute. you can go back and change it 
because you still have the address there, so you don't have to go write anything down. You just have to change JSR, which is 20, to bit, which is 2C. That's not what bit is actually for. What, it's, what it does is set three flags, the zero flag, um, the overflow flag, and the sign flag. So this is code from an upcoming project, which I'll have a further demonstration of on Saturday, where I call a routine that, uh, to check, if the, check how much memory you have. And it sets the carry flag uh, if you have 128K, and otherwise it clears the carry flag. And then I take that and I rotate it into the high bit of a zero page address. I have a similar thing for a joystick and rotate that in. So now the high two bits of that address are Boolean flags for me. So what if I bit that address? Well, it turns out that bit will take bits, uh, the bit opcode will take bit seven, the highest bit of that, and set the sign bit. So I can say, bit and then immediately branch uh, saying no joystick or uh, it will take bit six and put it the bit opcode will take um, will put will set the overflow bit to the value that was in this um, parameter and then you can branch on that branch if overflow clear branch if overflow set so very simply and without changing any registers you can check you can set boolean flags in the two high bits of any memory address and then check them and branch on them later all right next we have mark lemmert thank you Hello. So what I have today uh, is an opti optimization tip for anybody who's making the transition between being a competent 6502 code writer and a optimized uh, code writer. And uh, the uh, example up here is um, uh, illustrative of uh, how I started to write code you know, the first objective being, you know, write out the logic in such a way that it works, even if it's not the most efficient way to do it. Uh, what this code has going for it, which, which is in summary to toggle the volume flag variable between zero and one. Uh, if it's zero, we want it one. If it's one, we want it zero. What it has going for it is readability. Very readable, at least by assembly language standards. Uh, and uh, when I started to get into optimization, something that uh, others impressed upon me many times was that uh, optimization is a trade-off between memory, speed, disk space, and code readability. Um, what this code doesn't have going for it uh, is memory, uh, uh, and therefore, in tandem, disk space, those usually go together, or often go together, uh, or, or speed, which may or may not be relevant. Speed may or may not be relevant, depending on where you have the code uh, in your routine. Uh, but it uses 19 bytes, and there's a way to do the same thing using only eight bytes, um, with really not too bad of a trade-off on the readability side. Uh, it just takes uh, an, an extra mental leap so we'll go take a look at an example here. Uh, and so in this example, using only um, eight bytes, uh, we're toggling the volume flag between zero and one using the EOR uh, opcode uh, or exclusive OR. And uh, uh, I'm gonna take a look at, uh, kind of pop the hood a little bit and, and show what's happening with the EOR because I, I remember the point where I went from writing code like the first example to writing like the second example, and it, it, my brain was in a state of, okay, I, 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 I kind of logically understand what EOR does, uh, but not well enough to know, be comfortable using it or necessarily instinctively know when to use it. So if anybody else is in a similar state, I thought it would be helpful to actually take a look at what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So there's two basic scenarios uh, that, that are occurring here. This is, uh, the volume flag is either gonna be zero or one when the routine starts. So in this, this scenario, 
volume flag is is zero, uh, and so we've got the binary uh, expression of that there, uh, along with applying the EOR of one in the binary expression. And the way EOR works um, is uh, uh, it returns a result of one uh, in any bit position where uh, both values in both the accumulator and the, the EOR value, if, if one of the two has a one in it, EOR returns a one, but not if both have a one. So we only have a one in uh, th uh, the first bit position in one of the two values, so therefore it returns one into the accumulator, and we've therefore toggled the volume flag from zero to one, exactly what we want. And then the second scenario is the opposite, where volume flag comes in uh, at a value of one, then we apply the EOR of one, and since the rule stated before says that if both uh, values have a one in any bit position, you're gonna get a zero back. That's exactly what happens. We get zero uh, in the accumulator and uh, volume is in the desired state. Uh, so that's it. Is there time for a question? There is. If there are any, pretty straightforward stuff, but. Okay. All right, Charles. Oh, this guy again. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you're going to have to do uh, if you're ever creating anything with graphics is uh, you're going to have to clear the screen. And in this, in this case, um, we're going to do it the, the low-res screen because that's where I, I like to live in low-res, uh, big blocky pixels and all. Uh, and so to get yourself a nice clean palette, nice clean... Um, canvas to, to run on, you're going to need to fill the screen, and the, uh, the way to do that in, um, in the uh, basic mode, uh, not basic, but basic, but in the uh, simplified assembly language mode, uh, level one difficulty is to use the ROM routine. You look it up in the book, it says this is the routine you use to fill everybody on the screen with a particular color, so you load a color, which is another uh, zero page byte. Store it. Actually, it should be it should be STA whatever, uh, and then you uh, JSR to F eight thirty two, and that will go across the screen, every pixel on the lower edge screen, and fill it with that color that you loaded, and that's great. And you can watch it happen because it goes so slowly, <coughs> because it takes two hundred seventeen thousand seven hundred twenty nine instructions to do that, and on a one megahertz machine, that's what is that, uh, two tenths of a second, something like that, it, you can see it happening. But it takes like four bytes, so do it, right? I mean, you looked it up in the book, the book says this is how you fill the screen, uh, and then you can go on and draw your pixels with whatever other drawing routine, uh, character out or whatever um, the, the book says, and uh, you've got your nice blank canvas. Um, the next thing you can do is to crib from uh, compute, exclamation mark, magazine, uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a slightly modified uh, routine that I found from Compute. It was uh, uh, the fill screen fast routine, uh, which instead of using a lookup table, it just has the values for the, the different lines of the low res screen and fills them with your color at uh, 78 hex bits or uh, bytes at a time. So 400 to 478, 480 to whatever, 500, 500 and, and it goes on and loops through that um, with the indirect addressing mode, which is something that you learn after you've read the first couple of chapters of the book uh, and have found all the ROM routines that you need. And then you've got your first game and it's going really slow and then you find out, oh, hey, there's this other way to do it. Uh, so this is, this is great, this is really fast. It's only 5,403 instructions, which goes faster than the eye can see usually, uh, unless you happen to catch it on a uh, refresh cycle on your monitor. Um, but in this case, it's, uh, it's nice and fast. It takes up a little bit more space in your code and thus on disk, but it's not so bad. Uh, the absolute fastest way to do it is the, um, the unroll the loops way. This is the, uh, I'm gonna gouge my eyes out if I have to type this all in by hand mode, uh, <laughs> where you load, your, you load your color and then you store it at 400 and then 401 and 402 and 403 and keep going till 478 and then you keep going again at, uh, at 500 and then 580 and then eventually end up at 7 of 8 which is 960 addresses that you have to type in by hand uh, times, uh, times four instructions each. That ends up as uh, 3,842 instructions which is the fastest way to do it but it takes up 
somebody can do the math, uh, bytes of your code and thus memory um, for a savings of about 30%. So if you really want to do it that way, you could go onto advanced mode, which I don't have, um, which is the, uh, the, the level in Doom where the guy's already like really raged up uh, and write some code that then writes this for you so you don't have to write it. But you still have to write the code that writes it. So that's the advanced mode. Uh, how am I doing for time? You have one minute. Any questions? <coughs> All right, cool. So uh, level one, read the book. Level two, finish the book. Level three, hurt yourself. <laughs> don't hurt yourself. <laughs> All right, next we have Forrest. This is an impossible talk in five minutes. <laughs> yes. The, yeah. Those are all the arithmetic instructions on the 6502. You'll no notice there's no multiply and no divide. I was going to do this for a 256 byte number, but I discovered a gotcha, so it's, I settled for the 64 bytes that some, or 64 bits somebody suggested. Those are the routines that move a number from one area to another, zero the number, on this, by the way, very high order gloss, and that finds the highest bit in the number, that or highest byte in the number that's got data in it. This is useful and not useful, but you can figure it out. It's not, it's not real code, obviously. There's no headers and getting ready. These are the add and subtract routines that use the numbers, by the way, these are stored in little Indian format, just like addresses are. First byte is the lowest order byte, last byte is the highest order byte, and you have to do arithmetic from low order to high order when you're adding and subtracting, because your carry bits matter. Okay, the third thing here at the bottom, it's in two parts, shifts in the left direction, which is the same as multiplying by two, much used. There's a summary thing. You'll be, you'll be able to read it in the notes when they're published. Now, I did a sort of cross between pseudocode and code here for the multiply routine. I load the addresses into the addresses of the register, the fields in the memory, into three zero page pairs. Then I do my shifting and whatnot here. Arithmetic is not simple when you get to multiply. There's the simple way, which is very slow, like his thing. You add, you want to multiply 10 by 20, you add 10 together to itself 20 times. Bingo, that's a multiply. What? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. In this instance, you, the other opposite end is you take, here's a fixed field, here's a fixed field, and here's another fixed field, and you write code that does it with comparing the two. That's a lot quicker, but it's sort of fixed. Here, what I'm doing is I'm finding the tops of the numbers and then taking the first one, first bit is there, it's multiplying, so I add it into a accumulator. Then I shift this, shift this, is it a one or a zero? If it's a zero, I shift this and go on to the next bit. If it's a one, I add it and then go on to the next bit, shifting. And it's just a shift, add, shift, add, shift, add. And it's a binary equivalent of our long multiplication. Now we get into the fun one, division. Division is a pain in the ass. Um, you have to subtract multiple times if you want to do a real simple way. And that's a slower operation, lots and lots of times. And then when you get to the end and you suddenly find your, your result has gone negative, you have to add it back in again, and that's messy. So what you do instead is you line them up, and you look at the, you line up the largest bit in the two numbers, and you figure out how far you had to shift the divisor to make it that way. And then you move it down one, subtract, if, it's, if, if the divisor's 
smaller than this, you subtract it, and it just and you shift the results into your quotient, and it, it, it's all pretty well self-explained. But it takes four pages. One minute. Thank you. And in the end, you end up with your three numbers. Your divisor is still there. Your dividend has gone away and been replaced by the remainder. And your product, or your quotient, is in the third registry. So there you have it. And as you see, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> I'm in the process of writing the code to actually do this. Questions? If you followed that in detail and you understand it already, you're blessed. <laughs> It depends on, it's, it's totally dependent upon your numbers. But this can be hundreds of times faster, maybe even thousands of times faster than just repeatedly subtracting. So, that it? Thanks, Forrest. <laughs> All right, you guys are doing great. All right, next we got Michael Sternberg. All right, so I picked some code that I found while disassembling the uh, Atari version of the Play-Doh terminal emulator that was released in the early 80s. I liked it because uh, I liked the way the stars aligned to, to come up with an elegant solution. Also, it should be accessible even if you're not overly familiar with assembly language. So the problem they were trying to solve was that the, the, uh, computer was, the home computer was receiving a coordinate system from the original Play-Doh system that would be 512 by 512 and having to translate that into a 320 by 1982 uh, resolution. So, um, so for example, in the top right corner is 511, 511. Uh, it would have to be translated into, well, really 0, 191 on the Atari. So why did Plato have a 512 by 512 uh, resolution? Uh, part of it was they had a pretty generous um, character bitmap, 16 by 8, and and that gave him uh, a 64 by 32 characters. And, uh, and they were wor working off of a supercomputer that had 60-bit words and, pr and peripherals had 12-bit words. So nine bits for the resolutions is just fine. So why did the Atari have a 320 by 192? It was really constrained by the NTSC signal, which you know, goes back to the 50s. And, um, and so, they, so the, the TV would allow 352 visible half clocks. That's basically a pixel. Uh, if you take the Atari's 8 by 8 bitmap, 40 of those across is 320, and then uh, 24 lines of that is 192. And so if you looked at the ratio between those two, ratio, those two resolutions, you would see a point, point 0.625 for the X resolution and 0.375 for the vertical resolution. And so this is where someone would not thinking it through might say, hey, lookup table, and have um, two arrays, 512 entries long, and the index of the input would point to what you want. But um, thinking about um, some, some of the commands in, available on the 6502, uh, there are bit shifts, so one of the properties of binary numbers is if you um, shift all the bits one spot to the left, uh, it effectively doubles the number, so in the top, uh, there's a bit set at, at the, in the eighth position and the one position that, that represents nine. You shift that over, it's in the 16th position and the two position now, and it's um, 18. And if you go the other way, uh, you can half the number, in, like integer division. The, the, the least uh, significant bit will follow into the carry. But if you step back and not look at it as, as a as a 0.625 and say, realize, hey, this is 5 eighths, and hey, this is 3 eighths. And if you look at 5 eighths and 3 eighths, you can say, well, that's half plus 1 eighth, and that's 1 quarter plus 1 eighth. And you can get those by shifting. So if you shift once, you get half, shift against, so you get a quarter, and so on. So this is the code that was used in, in, the, uh, in the cartridge. And um, at the very top, uh, it has the most significant byte from the um, from the Plato x x coordinate, which would be zero through five one one, loads into the A. Uh, or I mean, sorry, um, 
shifts it to the right. And because that property of it dropping into the carry, so it, it, because 511 is nine bits, that um, the most significant by will only be at a maximum of one. So that, that will shift into the carry. Um, and that will become important later on. And then the um, and then the least significant bytes loaded into A. We'll can ignore that the next step, but the rotate A will will pull that ninth bit from the first one uh, from the most significant byte will get pulled from from the carry, and that's set saved for later on. So that was the first shift. That rotate right is the first shift, and then so they save the one half, and then and then they do two more shifts to get to the one eighth. Yep, and then, and then you, you can see the add carry at the bottom where where they add the results of the of the uh, one half and the eighth that would still in the accumulator, and then a little bit more math at the bottom to um, to save it out for the most significant bit byte. But that, that's it. It is squished. It is. They, they offered a, a, on the 48K model, they offered a, a second display of the resolution that, that you would pan around. Okay? And it looked, and, it, and, it, and that animation is, is pretty spectacular because how quickly you can do that. Thank you. All right, we have to switch monitors here. Okay, um, the concept for this, um, I think, was born when my brother got a color computer from Radio Shack and kept trying to find some way to prove that his computer was better, stronger, or faster than mine, my Apple IIe. Um, so a friend and I, this is about 35 years ago, decided to see how fast we could um, just count digits. So that's a simple program in AppleSoft. Which just does this. And you can see the ones digit, you can't really read it. The tens digit is going pretty quick, but you can read it. The hundred digit obviously takes its time. And that's just counting to a thousand. Um, to duplicate what I did in assembly language, this is a somewhat more complex uh, program which does the ones digit and then it comes down here to do the tens and back to, to do the one and then ten and then when this carries over it does the hundreds and comes back. So it's got actually just a second separate set of lines for each um, digit. So it's got the leading zero. And it seems to be roughly the same speed. But uh, in assembly language, this is doing five digits instead of just three with no loop. And so it's got the same thing where it's doing the ones, and then it does the tens, and the hundreds, and the thousands, and the ten thousands. The same code duplicated for the next digit over. And that one, I don't know if this is just a, an artifact of the of Virtual 2 or if it would look the same on actual hardware. But the hundreds digit, did you notice that? I think it's just a stroboscopic effect on the on the hundreds digit there, that it looks like it's not changing, but the the thousands digit you can see is very fast. Um, and then to make the program smaller and put it into a loop, 
I did this, where I actually um, asked for a key press, just using the get call in AppleSoft to get a single digit. And I know that, but I'm also in Prodos. <laughs> So if I give it the same number of digits, this one, because it's in loops as opposed to just a direct code, that 100 digit you can see changing. Um, but I can also give it more digits. But you can see with, with the basic, just counting to 1,000, you, you know, the 100 digit was visible and there you know even to the thousands you, you can't read it got to come over here to be able to read the digit so uh, I think that's yep that's all I got any questions um, my brother never was able to beat the Apple II. He he found some poke that supposedly doubled the clock speed or something and it still couldn't. There may have been some things where, where his basic beat Applesoft, but it couldn't touch integer. <laughs> Any others? No. No. Neat thing with it. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six digits that you can't read. <laughs> oh, and, and one thing I, I forgot to mention, um, if you look at where we're actually storing these digits, um, the, the screen address is 400, and it's, it's loading at screen comma y. So rather than counting somewhere and then outputting to the screen, we were just changing the actual screen locations so that to maximize the speed. Any more? I guess that's it. All right. Any questions for any of the speakers? That's it. Okay. Well, let's uh, thank all of. Oh, wait, wait, Ivan. Yes. Yes. Is everybody okay with that? We have time. Yeah. Go for it. Run. <laughs> oh. Run in a speedy way. Or walk in a speedy way. I'm going to put you on the timer, though. You're wonderful. Okay. Oh, do I need a mic? Hello, Kansas Fest. Okay, we're going to go fast. Um, this talk is about the overflow flag, which was always an area of murkiness for me, and now I love it. So I'm going to quickly review what the overflow flag is in case it's a little murky for you. Maybe you understand it perfectly, but maybe you don't. Okay. 6502 and 65CO2 have four branchable flags. They are these, overflow negative um, carry and zero, and, uh, but, you know, I think the latter three are reasonably well understood, but the first is not as, as much. So we're gonna go over what it is. What is it? It is this. You know that a byte can go from zero to 255, but that same byte, if you consider bit seven to be a sign, in fact, can be said to go from minus 128 to 127 instead. So if that byte is said to represent a two's complement number, as it is called, um, then it's, it's, it's a number, then if the, bit, the, the first bit is set, that means that it's a negative number. So what happens if you add two of these 
signed numbers together? Well, you might end up with a number that is greater than 127 or less than minus 128. And when that happens, you get an overflow. And guess what, guess what gets set? The overflow flag. Does that make sense to, to anyone? Does it not make sense to anyone? All right. That's most of it. If I don't finish the rest of it, that's OK. But quickly, all right. What triggers it? Only ADC or SBC upon what I just described, not if you're in 6502 decimal mode that I know you use. OK, what, what can, how do you clear it? CLV. How do you set it? There is no command to set it, but you can use, as Mark described, you can use bit against an address that has bit six set, and that will set it. So like you can use bit FF58, that contains a 60, um, and that will set the overflow flag. So that's what I usually do when I want to set it manually. There are only two other opcodes that affect it, which are PLP, which is pull processor status from stack, and RTI, which is like uh, an RTS, but it also pulls the processor status from the stack. And that also makes it very persistent. It makes it as a, so it's useful as a state toggle. Just beware of ROM calls, but it is not affected by INC, INX, or anything else for that matter. An obscure curio of it is that it can also be set by pulling in hardware pin 38 on a 6502 from high to low, that will set the overflow flag. It's sometimes called the SO pin, which stands for set overflow. And I don't know of anyone who actually implemented anything using that as a piece of hardware. That's it. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> so, so they decided they needed it, but they decided they didn't need it so badly that they needed a set flag instruction for it. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good story. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. That was two minutes. Can anyone do an assembly uh, talk in one minute? <laughs> we optimize Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's thank all of our speakers again.